have a lot of things to do today, uh, so we're going to get started with a couple songs. We have a video we'll play in a minute, and uh, before I forget, I want to make sure I say thank you to everybody that helped with the wedding yesterday. That was probably the smoothest wedding that we've ever been to. Uh, we were done in 45 minutes, the sound guy told me, and uh, I, thought it, I thought overall it went really well. Everybody remembered their parts and their timing, and it was a blessing to be a part of that, so thank you for helping with that. I know a lot of you put hours and hours into setup and clean up. So uh, thank you for being here this morning. The weather is changing, so I hope that it's cheerier in here than it is outside today. But let's start with the song number 55 in the Blue Songbook, number 55, Come Christians, Join to Sing. We sang this one recently, if it's new for you. Uh, we did sing it a couple weeks ago. We'll try to put this on the rotation to learn. <laughs> not mix it up just yet. All right, all together on the second. Ready on the second. Come lift your hearts on high. Back a couple pages, number 17. Number 17, come thou fount.
I feel it prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. All right. 108. 108. Sorry for the hesitation. I was like, are we going to do a new song again? Because I feel you. Our usual song leader is gone today. He's preoccupied with other things. <laughs> but he, um, he's been singing a couple new ones and introducing them and keeping track and putting them on a rotation. And I know, I know that you like to sing the old ones because you know the old ones. I know that. And uh, I just don't think like the world thinks. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm just an odd person. But when you when you work at a work at a, pu- a building and they're playing the music all day long from the radio station all day long, and the new hit song comes on all day long, and you have to hear it six times in the same day, and then six times the next day. I remember this when I was in high school as a kid. I couldn't handle the Lemon Tree song any longer. It was about a crazy person going crazy, and it made everybody that heard it go crazy. (laughs) And then you get every Luke Combs brand new country song on the radio all day long, and you're like, I just want to learn the new song. And I don't think that way. I don't know what what else to tell you. I just don't think that way. Uh, There is some wordiness to this song here. We sang it a week or two weeks ago, so it should be familiar to to you if you were here a couple weeks ago. Um, And I do realize that it has a 1584-ish kind of feel. I know that... Um, that whoever Theodophus was back in the dark ages of, of the Orleans in the 700s, uh, I know that maybe you and him aren't the same personality type. But there are some things in this song that I think would be a blessing to you. And there's these old hymns is what gets you through the tough times in life. It isn't the rock music. And it isn't the country music. And if that's your thing, I'm not preaching on that today. I, I've said it many times, I don't care. But I do care about the hymns. The hymns are what get you through. And there's some depth here. Some people that went through something in their Christian life, fighting every month, trying to keep staying right with the Lord and please the Lord. We will talk about that a little bit today. Number 108. If you know it from a couple weeks ago, please help me sing it out. If not, just listen through on the first verse and try to join us on the second. I'm still working out that last line here. Let's try it on the second. The company of angels are praising thee on high, and mortal men and all things created make reply. The people of the Hebrews with palms before thee went. Our For the announcements, 438. 438 footsteps of Jesus.
the second. Everybody join in on the chorus. Ready? Oh. Street preaching, November 5th, weather permitting. It's the first Saturday at uh, the corner of King Avenue and 24th Street. We'll meet there. And you're inviting to Thanksgiving dinner here at the church, November 24th. Okay, and then uh, flyers for the church invites, Tuesday, October 25th. Oh, okay, so, and then uh, team group, team group event, November 9th. Uh, please RSVP John or Jordan, okay, for the teens. And then uh, there's plenty of food for lunch after church, so stick around if you can. Good. Lots of food, so stick around. All right, and then we have a special music coming up.
everybody involved here. I can't hear that song without hearing this song, number 361.
piano and everybody sing as loud as you did that time, if you would. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, thy wings shall my petition bear to him whose truth, amen, and faith. to the to Billings a couple months ago. It had been about, oh, eight weeks or so, uh, maybe nine or ten weeks ago, and did a day of videoing here on Saturday and a day of videoing on Sunday to try to represent our church so we can get some flyers out. That's the flyers he announced. We should have a bundle of them, a uh, pretty big package of them coming on Tuesday this week, so we'll get those out uh, this Wednesday and this Sunday. Uh, Lord willing, the printing goes smoothly. And then uh, the the link on the video or on the flyer goes to a welcome video to our church. And then there's also two additional videos. So uh, we call them changed life testimonies. So last week we saw Brother Mikhail's testimony. And if you know anybody that uh, is his age or his experience or his situation in life, uh, look that up on our website and forward that link to somebody else. It's a three-minute video. Um, it's very clear what happened to him uh, when he got saved, and it was part of this church having a big part of that. And then uh, this Change Life testimony is Emma's, so everybody got to see her yesterday. Uh, if you were at the wedding, and most of you know her here, she likes to sit here and then sit back there and then sit here and then sit back there. So we'll see what happens next Sunday. I'm, I've been waiting for a couple of months to see how this follow-up goes through. Um, but Emma was not in such a good place uh, a year or two ago, and she talks about that in this testimony. So, again, if you know this could be a help to somebody, uh, get the link afterwards. I'll try to uh, – I was supposed to post it already, and I ran out of time yesterday. But uh, we'll try to get that posted this afternoon, and then you can find it again on the website. Just scroll through it and, um, and forward it to other people. Okay, is that mic hot there? Oh, yes. Let's do that real quick. Thank you. I'll wait till he gets back there in case it's too loud or too quiet. That'll do. Okay. Okay, you ready for this? Here we go. So, it was on medication. That was um, probably the hardest thing that just kept me from growing. I already know that one. So the medication that I was on before um, was for fibromyalgia. So So 
So I was on medication. That was um, probably the hardest thing that just kept me from growing. I already know that one. So the medication that I was on before um, was for fibromyalgia. So your body just hurts all the time. And I was um, severely depressed. So it was an antidepressant also. So it was mainly for the pain control, but then they found out, like the doctors kept saying that I was severely depressed. Um, and so I believed them, but I couldn't figure out why I was depressed, even still um, just having to get medication. And so um, that kind of changed my whole personality. And this was before church even too, like just um, at that time, um, I was very like not lost, but kind of backslidden a little bit, looking for the truth. Um, I had been looking for the truth for quite a long time. And right as soon as I walked in the church, I got greeted, which didn't happen at any of the other seven churches I visited in town. Um, and it wasn't like a, hi, how are you doing? Here's a pamphlet. It was more like, hey, my name is this. And they actually like made it really friendly and family oriented. And um, then just, it was a really sweet little building. And I could just tell the atmosphere was just different. The Lord kind of got a hold of me. Um, one night, it was uh, December 9th, I was going to um, off myself with a weapon that I had 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 and I was hurting myself a lot and it was um, hard getting to that level and that medication is wicked it makes you feel like you are not worth anything it makes you feel like you um, aren't good enough for anyone and that the Lord doesn't love you even though I already knew he did Um, just that one night, um, I was in the middle of hurting, and it kind of, I don't know how th that feels, but I remember the Lord just kind of like looking down at me and saying, hey, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here for you. So the transformation started um, that day. Um, I had a whole new outlook, which I don't know how is possible as the Lord working, like for sure. Um, I started to realize that people do love me. Um, they're around me that, that love me. Um, I do remember one of pastor's sermons um, that spoke to me saying that I am forgiven and that I, it's behind me um, to keep moving. Um, I don't have to look back anymore. <laughs> reading the Bible, like even just reading a psalm a day or just looking at the Proverbs in general, that's what I started with. Um, and just being able to be around people that are godly being around a church, go find a church, um, or let the Lord bring it to you like he did with me. Um, it's like I said, when I first walked in to the building, it was like instant family, and that's how church should feel. It shouldn't feel like you were just one of the sheep in the field there, and lots of people just singing and waving their hands. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. So you need to be around people that are caring and make you feel like family the minute you walk through that door. somebody that could be a help to if you do pass it along hmm. I can't I've already seen these multiple times I still can't <clears throat> get through the thing um yeah let's just go to our Bibles I'm not gonna comment anymore ja, ja, Joshua 22 Joshua 22 Yeah, it's a little bit overwhelming to do a wedding after knowing um, some of the history. So now you guys know a little bit of the history. All uh, right. I think they would appreciate if you keep them in your prayers. Um, I don't think they're going too far away, but traveling a little bit. And uh, just pray that the Lord uh, blesses their marriage and helps them to continue to learn and grow. And those of you who have been married know that... Um, you know, the old classic phrase, friendship, courtship, battleship. And uh, so they just entered the battleship. I don't think they know it yet, but they might have figured it out. Who knows? I think that's way funnier than you guys do. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, thank you again for your help with the wedding. And uh, I 
like I said, it went it went really smoothly, and uh, it's good to meet all of John's friends that he never talks about, and we didn't know that he had. <laughs> it's good to meet you guys. We knew he had friends, he just wouldn't admit to it. So thank you for showing up anyways, in spite of not receiving invitations and him assuming that people would pass them along to friends just because that's what people never do. Um, but he's a, uh, been a blessing to this church, and uh, Emma has been a blessing to this church. You saw a video there, and she uh, teaches Sunday school in the afternoon service, and then um, also she's grown and helped in this ministry and has been a big help to my wife, too, since... It's uh, it's just an investment. You help other people, and they help you. It's just you get in what you what you you get out of it, what you put into it. So, um, why don't you think about somebody other than yourself and put some time and effort, and you're going to get burned by people, and you're going to have people calling you drunk and stoned and high in the middle of the night and cussing you out, and that just comes with it. And then you have this. All right. This afternoon we have a question and answer, and we probably just have time for one question this afternoon. The question is, is dating okay? Is dating okay? And I'm looking forward to teaching that lesson. Uh, there's a no time in the Bible that talks about the word dating. And then some super spiritual Christians say that we only court. But I have bad news for you. Courting's not in there either. So uh, what you see in the Bible is quite different. And uh, I have a little different perspective on it. I'll try to present this afternoon and make that clear. And then if you have questions, whether you're a high schooler or a homeschooler or somewhere in between, um, if you have questions about that, I hope that those will be answered this afternoon. Is dating is dating okay? All right. So we're in Joshua chapter 22. Joshua chapter 22. And the very last verse in this chapter, why don't you turn to that first says, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar Ed, for it shall be a witness. Ed is a Hebrew word. It shall be a witness between us that the Lord is God. So Ed means witness. The title of my message this morning is, What Did Ed Witness? (laughs) What Did Ed Witness? Now, I can't chop this chapter up any way I see it because there's too many things spread out here that talks about human nature If I knew more about psychology, I see that all through here, but I don't know fully how to explain all of it. And then there's also some things going on with people's response to other people. That's sociology. And I don't know how to shorten this any except to read the whole chapter. So if you didn't read your Bible at all this week, I don't want to hear one peep out of you. This is one chapter. And if you do read your Bible every day, you certainly won't mind me reading one chapter. All right, Joshua 22 and verse 1. Then Joshua... He's about to fade off the scene here. He's getting pretty old. Called the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh. You say, who in the world are these people? Well, I should have drawn my chart earlier, but I didn't. So here's this scene here that, oh, there's no river there. Who am I doing? Here's this scene, football, Jordan River, Dead Sea, little hook. There's probably some nice rental properties there. And then you have the nine and a half tribes over here and the three and a half, nope, two and a half tribes over here. If you've ever read through your Bible and you got to this part, you're going to hear it over and over as we read the chapter. Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh. So half of Manasseh is on the west side and half of Manasseh is on the east side. And that'll make these numbers add up here in a minute. Verse two said unto them, ye have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord commanded you and have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. You have not left your brethren these many days unto this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. You went into the land and you fought like you're supposed to. And now the Lord your God hath given rest unto your brethren as he promised them. Therefore now return ye and get you unto your tents and unto the land of your possession, which Moses the servant of the Lord gave you on the other side of Jordan. Back when they were over here ready to cross Jordan, Moses said, Hey, boys, you're all going to go over here and fight for this land. And these three, Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh, they said, we don't want to go over to this side. We have a lot of cattle, and we see all this pasture land over here that we want to have a part of. And Moses said, here's the terms and conditions. If you come over this Jordan River and you fight with us until we take the land, then you can return back over and you can dwell in this land, but only if you fight. And if you don't come over, then you don't get to take the land. All right, so this is where they're at. They've taken the land. We've covered that. 
they set up the cities of refuge. We covered those in the last chapter, in, or chapter 20. And then in verse 21, it outlines the land. Chapter 21, it outlines the land. And now it's time for those men to go claim their promise under Moses. Verse 5, But take diligent heed unto to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you, to love the Lord your God, and to walk in all his ways, and to keep his commandments, and to cleave unto him, that means stick close to him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Now, if every Christian could just follow that verse, they would have zero problems in the Christian life. If you could just love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And you say, oh, I do. I love him with all my heart and all my soul. Your love is not known until it is tested. And when your love becomes tested, then we can see if your love holds true. I mean, what is love if there's nothing to hate? What is love if there's not another choice? And Adam and Eve's love was tested in the garden. Will you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and not eat that fruit because I told you not to eat it? Isn't that a boring thing? Like, I want a love movie. Nope, you get an apple on a tree and trusting the words of God. Your love is not known until it is tested. In verse 6, Joshua blessed them and sent them away. <clears throat> Excuse me, and they went unto their tents. Now to the one half of the tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given possession in Bashan, but unto the other half thereof gave Joshua among their brethren on this side, Jordan, westward. One part was east, one part was west. And when Joshua sent them away, also their tents, then he blessed them unto their tents. Verse 8, And he spake unto them, saying, Return with much riches unto your tents, and very much cattle, with silver, and with gold, and with brass, and with iron, and with very much raiment. Divide spoil of your enemies with your brethren. When they came in and took that land, they got a lot of goods from it. Remember old Achan back there? Stealing the little wedge of gold and a couple pieces of silver and the raiment. And if Achan could have just waited till chapter 22, he would have gotten all that. He probably would have gotten a lot more than he took that day. And if you, in your life, want the instant result right now, because you have to have it and you just can't think ahead for 12 hours down your <laughs> calendar, and you just have to have it now, you're never going to be satisfied in the Christian life. And sometimes you're going to make a huge mess, and Achan got himself killed over the situation, and he could have just waited with all the rest of the tribes and had the whole thing delivered to him in God's time. Verse 9, And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned and departed from the children of Israel out of Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go into the country of Gilead, to the land of their possession, all on the east side, where they were possessed according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. If you want that reference, that's Numbers 32 and verse 20 and continuing the rest of the chapter. Numbers 32, 20 is your cross-reference around there. Verse 10, And when they came unto the borders of Jordan that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see to. And here we have the reason for Schofield's title of this chapter. Anybody have a Schofield Bible today? They're getting less and less common these days, but I like to refer to mine when I'm getting a message ready. The heading of this chapter is the schismatic altar of Reuben and Gad. Schismatic meaning causing a division. And I like how Schofield stated it. He stated it without coming to a conclusion. He just said it caused a division. And in reading through this chapter, I want you to see if you can come to a conclusion. They built a great altar to see to. You say, what's wrong with that? Oh, we're about to find out. The children of Israel heard say, verse 11, Behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar over against the land of Canaan and the borders of Jordan at the passage of the children of Israel. And when the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go up to war against them for building a pile of stones. Verse 13, And the children of Israel sent unto the children of Reuben and unto the children of Gad and to the half-tribe of Manasseh into the land of Gilead. Who, who did they send? Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest. And with him ten princes of each chief house, a prince throughout all the tribes of Israel, and each one was a head of the household of their fathers unto the thousands of Israel. How many tribes are there? There's twelve. How come they only sent ten and said that's all the tribes of Israel? It's all the ten on this side. So it's the nine and the Manasseh that's represented halfway on here. All right? So there's ten, there's ten tribes that are represented here by the ten princes because they're on the west side, and they send Phineas as their leader. And they came unto the children of Reuben. 
Verse 15, And to the children of Gad, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, unto the land of Gilead, and they spake with them, saying, Thus saith the whole congregation of the Lord, What trespass is this that ye have committed against the God of Israel? To turn away this day from following the Lord, and that ye have builded you an altar, that you might rebel this day against the Lord. Would you turn over to Deuteronomy 12 with me? Hold your place there. Deuteronomy 12. Deuteronomy 12 and verse 13, Take heed therefore, uh, take heed to thyself, that thou offer not thy burnt offerings in every place that thou seest. What was the Old Testament command? You don't get to build an altar wherever you want. Verse 14, But in the place which the Lord shall choose in one of thy tribes, there thou shalt offer thy burnt offering, and there thou shalt do all that I command thee. Okay, go back to Joshua 22. So the tribe on the west thinks they've built an altar for sacrifice, and they accuse them of a trespass. Verse 17, they continue, Is this iniquity, is the iniquity of Peor too little for us, from which we are not cleansed until this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord? I may remember the story of a donkey talking to a man named Balaam. That's the iniquity of Peor. That's the short story. There's a lot more details to it. Now, this iniquity of Peor also took place in Numbers chapter 25. Would you turn with me there real quick? Let's get what they're referring to here in their, in their current event history. Leviticus, Numbers, uh, Numbers 25. Numbers 25 and verse 3. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. That's in connection with the Moabites in verse 1. The Moabites got their daughters to intermarry with the Israelites. And all of this came about because Balaam was used to instigate it with Balak the king. Now look who's a part of this thing. Numbers 25, 3. Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people... And hang them up before the Lord unto the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. You'd think that would cover it, but it doesn't. Verse 6, And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. While everybody's repenting, this guy's fornicating. Verse 7, When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in that plague were 20 and 4,000. Go back to Joshua chapter 22. Is the iniquity of Peor too little for us from which we are not cleansed unto this day? Who is the guy that threw the spear? Phinehas. Who's the head of all these princes in verse 13? Phineas, when you want to get a job done, and you want to get it done thoroughly, and you want people to die, if they need to die, you send Phineas. Verse, verse 18. But that ye must turn away this day from following the Lord, and it will be, seeing ye rebel today against the Lord, that note that tomorrow he will be wroth with the whole congregation of Israel. Notwithstanding, if the land of your possession be unclean, then pass ye over unto the land of the possession of the Lord, wherein the Lord's tabernacle dwelleth, and take possession among us. But rebel not against the Lord, nor rebel against us, in building you an altar beside the altar of the Lord our God. Did not Achan, the son of Zerah, commit a trespass in the accursed thing? We mentioned him earlier. And wrath fell on the congregation of Israel, and that man perished not alone in his iniquity. I think they're going to keep going. Did not we lose 3,000 men when we went to fight Ai? Did not Joshua make a league with the Gibeonites? And they get cut off in verse 21. Then the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh answered and said unto the heads of the children, thousands of Israel, The Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knoweth. And Israel, he shall know. If it be in rebellion or if in transgression against the Lord, save us not this day. If we're guilty of death, then take our lives. That's capital punishment. Verse 23, 
that we have built us an altar to turn from following the Lord, or if to offer thereon burnt offering or meat offering, or if to offer peace offerings thereon, let the Lord himself require it. And if we have not rather done it for fear of this thing, saying, here's the real reason we did it, in time to come your children might speak unto our children, saying, what have ye to do with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord hath made Jordan a border between us and you. Ye children of Reuben and children of Gad, ye have no part in the Lord. They're saying someday somebody's going to say that to us. Reuben and Gad and Manasseh, you don't have a part in the Lord. So shall your children on the west side make our children on the east side cease from fearing the Lord. Therefore we said, let us now prepare to build us an altar, not for burnt offering nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between us and you and our generations after us that we might do the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings and with our sacrifices and with our peace offerings that your children may not say to our children in time to come, ye have no part in the Lord. Therefore said we that it will be, it shall be when they say so to us or to our generations in time to come that we may say again, behold, the pattern of the altar of the Lord which our fathers made, not for burnt offerings, not for sacrifices, but it is a witness between us and you. God forbid that we should rebel against the Lord and turn this day from following the Lord to build an altar for burnt offerings, for meat offerings, or for sacrifices beside the altar of the Lord our God that is before this tab his tabernacle. Now, did that clarify it pretty well, what their intentions are? Okay. Now, we're going to read the last couple of verses here, and I want you to decide who is right and who is wrong in this thing. Look at verse 30. And when Phinehas the priest and the princes of the congregation, the heads of thousands of Israel which were with him, heard the words that the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the children of Manasseh spake, it pleased them. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, said unto the children of Israel, or Reuben, and to the children of Gad, the children of Manasseh, This day we perceive that the Lord is among us, because ye have not committed this trespass against the Lord. Now ye have delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of the Lord. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, and the princes returned from the children of Reuben and from the children of Gad into the land of Gilead, unto the land of Canaan, to the children of Israel, and brought them word again. And the thing pleased the children of Israel. And the children of Israel blessed God and did not intend to go up against them into battle to destroy the land wherein the children of Reuben and Gad dwelt. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar Ed, for it shall be a witness between us that the Lord is God. All right, you young people, who's on this side? Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh. Has everybody got that? It's going to be on a quiz someday in your life. I guarantee it. Who's on this side? If you're 12 or younger. Who's on this side? Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh. We're going to give up right there. Okay. All right. It's too much for this early on a cloudy, rainy day. Let's pray and get in there and see what this altar witnessed. Lord, I ask that you'd please bless your words this morning. I ask you bless this thought. Yes, you help us to examine our own hearts. We all have uh, hearts of flesh, Lord, and hearts that um, think carnal things and have it all figured out with our own logic and reasoning. And, Lord, we need your help and we need your guidance and these things that come up in life daily, and especially big events come up uh, sometimes monthly or yearly. Lord, I ask that you please help us to learn something from the lesson that these men taught us a couple thousand years ago. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Who's right and who's wrong? Isn't that always the question of the day? Who's right and who's right? Well, of course you're right, right? I mean, if you agree with me, then you can be right too. <laughs> I was wrong once, and I don't intend to be wrong again. Maybe I'm wrong this time, but it's been a long time. Everybody has their little catchy sayings, and, and it comes down to this, um, me first and you next. Isn't that the fleshly attitude? It's so natural for us to think of, i got to take care of me, and there are some things where you have to take care of yourself first. Uh, certainly you should get saved first before you lead other people to the Lord. Yes. Certainly, if you're in an airplane, you should put your mask on first before helping other people. Don't they tell you that every time? Shouldn't you take care of your own spiritual health before you go try to tell everybody else their business and how to run their life? Amen, amen. We've all been a part of both sides of that, probably. But the question comes up in this passage is, why do you care? Why do you care? Why do the ten tribes on one side care what the three tribes on the other side care are doing? Why do they care so much? You have a bunch of ten tribes there that the Lord's given them the land and they promised them something. And why do they care? Maybe somebody cares because they're genuinely concerned about the other side rebelling. That's a good reason to care. 
Maybe they care because they're just uh, cantankerous people and they're just looking for another fight. You know the danger in training and raising up a bunch of people that fight and that put on the whole armor of God and not to do battle with the world and just want to slay everybody they meet and soul winning, soul winning, soul winning. You know the danger of that? When there ain't nobody else to kill outside the church, they'll turn on the church and kill everybody inside the church. And when there ain't nobody else left inside the church, they'll just turn on the preacher and kill him. Now, I didn't say that, and I didn't figure that out on my own. A 75-year-old preacher told me that three months ago. And he said, you better be careful in your church raising a bunch of killers because you need people that go out in the community, and they are zealous for the truth like Finney has and ready to kill at a moment's notice. But it's not all about killing. You know what that sword can do, that sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God? You know what that sword can do? It can chop off somebody's head like Peter intended to do and sometimes get an ear. It can be like Samson and go sling around and slay a bunch of people. And that sword is like a laser that can perform precise (laughs) surgery on the soul of man and cut out a cancerous thing inside of them and open up with the light of the Word of God, the truth that's going on and be a healing help to somebody else. Now, don't you know that a knife blade can kill somebody and can heal somebody depending on whose hand it's in. Now, if all you can do with the sword is use it in an offensive warfare, well, that's a good start. And would to God there was more Samsons in the church because we got a lot of people just sitting doing nothing in the church, well, well aware of our body of Christ situation in these Laodicean last days. But you better be careful once you learn how to use the sword that you don't only use it for one tool, that you use it to be a help to somebody else. These men here are ready to start a civil war over a pile of stones. And what did they say? Verse 16, the whole congregation of the Lord. What trespass is this that ye have committed? It isn't a trespass. I turned you to a verse in Deuteronomy. Did that verse in Deuteronomy, there's another cross-reference in Leviticus I failed to put in those notes. Uh, Did that reference in Deuteronomy tell you that you couldn't build a pile of stones as an altar? It said you couldn't build a pile of stones and offer a sacrifice on it. And the same thing in the Leviticus reference. What trespass is this? It isn't a trespass. Verse 18, but that you must turn away this day from following the Lord. The ten tribes on the west side made a false assumption, and it led to a false accusation, seeing ye rebel today against the Lord. Have you ever been in that situation where you just jump to a conclusion and then you started building on that conclusion that you jumped to and now you're adding speculation to assumption and then it just eats you up and I can't believe that brother said or is doing or, or thinks this or he treated somebody so and so a certain way. And then you have to back away and say, you know what, I think I was wrong in that whole situation because I didn't get the whole story before I went and armed for war. Now, this is what I call a preventative maintenance sermon. I don't know of this going on in the church. I don't think, I'm pretty sure it's not going on. Pretty sure I know it's back here. Uh, Maybe somebody had a phone call this week I don't know about. So if this sermon's for you and you're wasting all of our time, why don't you just come forward, repent, and we can be dismissed and go eat that food back there. (laughs) Um, I don't know if that's the case. I think of this as a preventative maintenance sermon, kind of like this afternoon, uh, is dating a good thing? I think of that as preventative maintenance. I mean, how many people we got coming up to that age thinking about it? Is it okay? What's the Bible say about it? Are we even supposed to do this? Is it right at all? Is it always wrong? I mean, there's a thousand questions, and then somebody might someday in their life, hopefully this afternoon, pull out a Bible and give them a clear answer, and they can go on with confidence. Hey, I know how to do right in this situation. It's a preventative maintenance thing. And I think a lot of preaching gets behind the eight ball and they stand up and rant and rave or get mad and get furious about things going on in church that you could have seen like a rocket a thousand miles away if you would have just had your defenses up and had a little spiritual discernment. I think this is a good preventative maintenance sermon for the Christian life that you can see a problem in somebody else's life and respond to it properly. And I don't think they handled it very properly here. Now I'll give them one thing. They go up with some false accusations. They call it a trespass and rebellion and turning away from God. And then in verse 19, verse 19, they make this statement. Notwithstanding, if the land of your possession be unclean, then pass ye over unto the land of the possession of the Lord, 
wherein the Lord's tabernacle dwelleth. If you guys are going to go over here and rebel and build an altar and be a bunch of wicked heathens, then I don't think you should be over there. You should just come back over here and live with us. Now, that attitude, man, I've been around that way too much. That attitude even found its ways into this notes Bible. That's why I'm not preaching on my usual Bible. Um, the attitude is because you're doing wrong over there and I'm making a false assumption about you doing wrong, you should just come back where it's safe and live with us. And that is not the way that the Lord leads Christians in the Christian life. If I'm on a job site with you, I do believe that you ought to be safe and you ought to work smart and all those things. But I don't believe safety first on the job site. I believe safety is from the Lord. What's first on a job site? Does anybody know? Nope. First on the job site is money. Can we all admit that we wouldn't be there if it wasn't for money? Well, nobody talks about that, but I just thought I'd clue you in. <laughs> kind of struck me one day at the 15th safety meeting for the year. We're not here for safety. We're here for money. And, yeah, if you stopped doing drugs and being stupid, you wouldn't get hurt. That's, I never saw anybody get hurt on a job site that wasn't out of it or there wasn't drugs involved. Every single one of them, somebody was uh, an idiot because of drugs, usually. No, everyone. Everyone, ask me later. So, anyhow, you know what some people say? Well, let's just take everything in this life. What are you talking about, you? I wasn't there for that one. I wasn't including you in this. If you need to repent, altar's here for you, too. Okay. I wasn't there. All right. Anyhow, this message got derailed already. This attitude of let's just play it safe is a really wicked attitude. Let's just play it safe and not go over to Africa because you can get malaria there. And Don't you care about the health of your kids? Let's just play it safe. Let's just play it safe and never move out of our parents' basement because don't you know that's the safest place you could be? Let's just play it safe and never move across the country. I'm not real excited about the thought of my kids moving across the country without me being just down the road. But then at the same time, didn't I give them over to the Lord when they were like this big? And then I had to re -up, renew that thing. I don't know what you parents do, but here's my suggestion. When they get to be about this big, you've got to renew the, the, the baby dedication giveaway. I don't know. We, maybe we should do that in our church. I kind of like that thing. Some people think it's corny. I think it's a good thing to dedicate your baby to the Lord and say, he's not mine. He's yours, Lord. But then... Then you have to do that again when they get bigger because you're like, okay, you have a lot of problems and I know every one of them because they're real similar to mine. And I know exactly where your trip-ups and faults and problems are going to be in this life, but you're not mine anymore. You're the Lord's. And there's going to come a time when you're somewhere between 13 and 18, probably never 18, 13 to 15 in my house, there's going to come a time where you're going to say, Mom and Dad, I don't like what you're thinking. I don't care to listen to you one bit. And I'm going to remind them at that point, that's okay. You're responsible to the Lord. And you can live here, and here's some guidelines, here's some rules, but we don't ever have to get into that stuff because we, well, that's the rest of the message. There comes a time where the thing has to be rededicated and say, children, you're under God. You're not under me directly. You're under the Lord that rules the universe. And you can get your instructions from Him because He gave you a conscience and a mind and a heart that can choose to serve him or choose to serve yourself. Amen. And if you'll turn your ch kids, you turn your children to the Lord, then you won't have to deal with the rebellion that goes on in so many homes in America that I know of today. Why don't you give them to the Lord and stop having this attitude of, if you're going to go out there, you're just going to rebel, so why don't you come home and stay with us where it's still clean? That's not clean. That's not a clean attitude. Why don't you stay in this place where the Lord gave us to possess instead of going to that other place that the Lord didn't give us to possess? He did give them to it to possess under a contract with Moses who set the terms and conditions. You fight with us, you can have more land on your side. And people say, well, those people, they just had a lot of cattle and they just wanted land and they're carnal and that whole thing going over there, they were the first to be taken into captivity. I've preached and said some of those things and I could give you the references on that and they're in this notes Bible today. Uh, let me 
say something else I'm not real sure about, but I'm just going to give you some food for thought. Do you know that a lot of people that are in the upper middle class in America, maybe they make uh, more than the 50% average. I don't know what that would be. That would probably be around two or $300,000 in America. You know that some of the people in that class, the reason that they have more money isn't because they're carnal and they love money. You know, some of them have a better realization and understanding of how the world works, and they have a better handle on, we heard a message recently on when your perception doesn't match your reality. Some of you have a perception in life that I am owed all these things, but you're not doing anything to work towards those things. And then other people, they say, I want to be over there. I'm going to set a goal. I'm going to get disciplined in my life. I'm not going to do these stupid distracting things. I'm not going to waste over here and waste over there. And I'm going to get there because I'm determined. And then a Christian walks by and says, you're carnal. No, they're more disciplined. They have more discipleship and character than some Christians that are faithful every Sunday. Okay, that's new. I don't expect an amen. Just think about it. I think there's a little bit of that attitude on this west side over here saying, look over there at all the wealth that your guys are just interested in the physical worldly prosperity, and you should come over here and stay with us. And the Lord's doing two different things with two different people, and they're making false accusations, and they're revealing their heart. They want to go to war. And they say, rebel not against the Lord, nor rebel against us in building you an altar besides the altar of the Lord our God. They take scripture and they misuse it. The scriptures never say anywhere that you can't build an altar anywhere you want. They say you can't build an altar anywhere you want and sacrifice on it. Don't you know when they came across Jericho, they built a little memorial out of stones? It's not called an altar, but in Joshua chapter 8, he built a different altar, and there's no sacrifice there. Now, Joshua built an altar, and it's not outside the tabernacle. You know, those Christians in church that have their false assumptions and their false accusations and accusing everybody else of rebelling because they got one thing right 10 years ago are a displeasure to the Lord. And like I said, I, I don't even know I'm saying this except as preventative maintenance because I have seen it many times in churches. There's a zealous tribe ready for war. What did Ed witness? Well, he saw that somebody wanted to fight and wanted a problem. What did this altar of Ed, what else did he witness? He witnessed some false assumptions that lead to accusations. What else did this altar of Ed witness? He witnessed 11 men that walked over and sought to know the truth. Now, of all the things I'm against them for, did they seek out the truth before they took up arms? They went over and they sent a committee over there and they said, what's actually going on here? And they made some false accusations and revealed their heart, but they sought to know the truth. But I wish that this altar of Ed had witnessed one more thing. If you read through the whole chapter, and that was part of the reason I did read through the whole chapter, did you read the pr word prayer one time in the chapter? Did you read sought the Lord one time in the chapter? No, we didn't. No, we didn't. There's a danger in Christianity and going to church every week and knowing what's right and hearing the truth preach and reading your Bible every day. There's a danger in you thinking that you automatically know what's right in any given situation because you are doing these spiritual things. There's a danger there. You sit and you think, yeah, I know what I should do here. I see this kid over here talking to this kid, and that's never going to work out. Hold on a second. Hold on. And what did God say? Well, he's going to have to come to me and ask about dating my daughter. Okay, well, maybe that's a good thing to do sometimes. I do it a little different, but I'm not going to let you in on my secret. Never mind. I almost gave it away. I do something a little different with my kids. But here's the end of it, and here's the middle of it, and here's the, ought to be the beginning of it. What does God say? I'm going to get to this in dating this afternoon. That'll be the end of it, so I'll give you the end of it, but there's a lot of in-between of it. When, a, when somebody decides that they're going to let their kids court and let their kids date, and that's certainly every home's got their own rules and, and things on that. Uh, when you decide that and then you say, I don't like him, I don't like her, you're not going to talk to them anymore. You have just placed yourself back in the position of God that you were supposed to leave when they came to their own age of accountability. You're supposed to transition through that and teach your children, okay, you're under me, you don't know who God is because you're three years old, so I feed you, clothe you, keep you alive, and I am all you know of God. And then you switch over, right? And then you teach your children, hey, God's over here. 
and God's over here and you're underneath the God and I'm over here and I'm your guide and protector and governing force and can put some limitations on you and I tell my children I say would you please consider what I have to say and I'm not going to make you do stuff when you get older now if you're going to live in this house then there's some rules and all that but like I said we don't have that problem yet I mean maybe maybe it'll be you or Rachel or Elijah I haven't I might not know what I'm talking about yet so far so far it hasn't been an issue with pointing my children to the Lord. But you know what I think makes it work? I think we're seeing here in Joshua chapter 22 the subtle beginnings of a third generation failure. Turn to Joshua chapter 24. One of the most powerful, life-changing messages I ever heard. I don't use those phrases very often. One of the most resonating sermons where I felt like the whole sermon was just I felt like I was getting shot at the whole ter- the whole time. Uh, it was a message I heard when I was in Bible school called "There is no fourth generation." And he preached on the first generation Christians and how they grow up and they're in the world and then they get saved out of the world and they're like, "Man, I appreciate the Lord," and all I want to do is like talk about Him and I don't care what anybody thinks I'm a fool. And then they raise up their kids and their kids are second generation Christians. And the second generation Christians, you can think Abraham, out of the world. Second generation, Isaac, what does he grow up in? He grows up in a Christian home, so to speak. He doesn't have to fight off the Canaanites and all this stuff. His daddy already did that. But then he makes the same mistakes as his dad and lies a couple times and has some of the same problems as his dad had, but a little worse. And then what happens in the third generation? Jacob and Esau, the thing goes to hell. That thing's a mess. Esau's a disaster, and Jacob barely comes out of it, and then he gets blessed in the end because of his humility and repentance in spite of his huge, huge glaring faults and sins. What happens in the third generation? Well, then the thing starts over. There's no fourth generation. It starts all over. And Joseph, where does he grow up in? In the world, not having the influence continually there with him anyways. And then his kids, Ephraim and Manasseh, kind of, break down a little bit, right, don't they? And then Ephraim turned out to be the worst tribe ever. But you can trace that through each individual, and you can trace that through David and Solomon and Rehoboam, and all through the scriptures. There is no fourth generation either. It blows apart in the third and starts over. But I haven't seen that in every Christian home that I know today in 2022. And here's where the difference is. Look at Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24, verse 29. And it came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath, uh, Tim, Timnath Sarah, which is in the Mount Ephraim on the north side of the hill Gaish. He's from Ephraim, so he's buried there. Verse 31. Highlight this, memorize it, mark it. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua. Good. And all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua. Those elders, which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. Period. Period. Where's the third generation? Look at the largest typeface words on the next page in your Bible. The book of Judges is the third generation. And you know how the book of Judges goes. It's a disaster. In the end of the verses of Judges, the last verse in the book says, Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You say, what happened? Where did it go wrong? Joshua told them it would go wrong, and I'll tell you why it will go wrong and how it can go right. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of the fathers that served on this side, on the side of the flood, other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There's two choices, serve God or serve the other gods. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Now, this is subtle and this is crafty, but I've been reading through this all week, and I think there's no other way around this. Do you see what they said in verse 16? It sounds good, and it ain't good. The people answered and said, God forbid. Well, that's a strong, that's what I say to the police officer. God forbid I wouldn't have my seatbelt on. Do I ever wear my seatbelt? No. God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. You know what's going on in the back of their mind every time they make this very commitment-sounding thing? 
they're still serving the other gods. And I'll prove it to you from the text. Look at verse 19. Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then He will turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that, He hath done good to you and done to you good. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord and put away our other gods. No, they didn't. We're going to go to church on Sunday and do whatever we please during the rest of the week. Joshua said to the people, Ye are witnesses against yourselves. That sounded like a good commitment to you, didn't it? And Joshua said, I hear what you're saying. It's not any good. Your commitment is horrible. Because you didn't say you're going to get rid of the strange gods. Verse 23, Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods, which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey. And put away the strange gods? No. Third strike, and Joshua gives up after that. Now, do you want to know how to avoid the subtle beginnings of a third generation failure? It's very simple. Put away the strange gods which are among you that your kids know all about. Say, who are you preaching to, Isaac? I have no idea, and I hope it's nobody. I hope it's purely preventative maintenance. Say, I want my kids to turn out right. I know of a family in five generations, and they got their problems, and they've gone through the toils and struggles of this life, but they're doing right, and their kids are doing right. So you're awfully interested in your kids. Wait till you have kids. You'll be interested in them too, and the grandkids to follow. You know what the Lord said? The Lord told you this stone, Ed, is going to be a witness. And what did it witness? It witnessed a people... <coughs> who were ready for war and wanted a problem when there wasn't a problem. It witnessed people who made false assumptions that led to false accusations. And it also witnessed some people that came to their senses and sought to know the truth. And it witnessed one person here, Joshua, who sought to know God's mind on the matter. And look at what Joshua says in verse 26. He wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a what? There's the same word, ed, in Hebrew. Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. It shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. So Joshua let the people depart, every man into his inheritance. This preacher today has to let the people depart, every man into his place in this life. It's not my job as a pastor to come into your home, to come into your car, to come into your school, to straighten out your locker room. It's not my job to come into your life and tell you how to do everything. It's my job to give you the truth and give you the tools that will enable you to raise your family right and please the Lord with your life. And the Lord is very gracious. You say, I've made too many mistakes. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. The Lord can take a lot of those mistakes and he can turn them out for good. I don't even know how he does it. The Lord takes some of the most wicked mistakes in the Bible, and you see it in the Bible. Like a man named Moses who killed a guy out of anger because he's got anger issues his whole life. Moses' anger issues were so bad they kept him from getting in the promised land. I think that his anger issues were worse than that because he killed a guy. And God said, yep, the killing the guy thing, we're going to forgive that. Striking a rock one day when you were having a bad day? Sorry. Climb up Mount Pisgah, Moses. Let's take a look. Here's what I wanted to give you. Here's the promised land. You're not going in. For striking a rock. Moses argues with God about it. This is silly, God. This is really silly. I smote a rock one day. And the Lord's like, no, no, no. There was an anger issue that you never gave to me. So now you're going to pay for that. But you made a mistake one time in killing a man. You made a mistake another time in how you treated your children and some other stuff. You made these different mistakes. Okay, hey, why don't you take those things to the Lord and leave them there, and then I will use those things to glorify me. But if you refuse to get rid of it for your whole life, then there's consequences that have to be dealt with. What's the secret to avoiding a third generation failure? The secret is for your second generation to see the first generation serving the Lord with a true heart. And many times that happens. But it's those second generation. Man, I know second generation Christians. 
and you've got it all paved ahead of you and you know all the answers and you know how to put on a good show and you know how to say the right things and you've already got this discipline and the character instilled into you, I don't have to think about tithing and attendance. Maybe that's why I never preach on it. I never think about it. I just thought that's what I was supposed to do because I was told that since nine months before I was born, so that's all that I know. And then because of that, I'm automatically spiritual. That's how things slip and slide and turn into a mess, and then your children see what's really going on. It's going to be just as big a fight for you as it was for your parents to serve the Lord. Nobody gets out of the fight. And if you take up arms and say, Lord, I need the help to fight again today. I am tired of fighting. Can I just be like the Catholics and give up the fight? I was really envying the Catholics this week. They were on my mind a little bit with the services and all that. And I was like, man, they got it made. You can kind of get along with the world. You can kind of get on these bandwagons that are trendy and tote the cause of morality and different issues and different social, cultural things that are going on. And kind of live however they want. And they don't have to fight their flesh. Wouldn't that be nice? But that's on this side. And I'm not just working for this side. If this side's all I got, I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> There's something on the other side that's far more lasting. Lord, I ask you please bless the message this morning. Joshua gave us something there in that last chapter. Kind of hidden. Not really on the surface there. Lord, we all know as for me and my house will serve the Lord. I ask that. Anybody who hasn't read that passage recently or understood it fully, even today, that they would review it and see what's happening there in that dialogue with that conversation. Lord, I ask if there's someone here today that uh, you've spoken to. Lord, I ask you put your um, gentle hand of reminding and on their shoulder and show them what you'd have them take care of or leave or start or whatever it is. Lord, I ask you please speak to people's hearts. Uh, Lord, I ask you to help me to set a good example for what I was preaching this morning, that um, the children who see you here at church and at home and at work sometimes, Lord, that they would see a consistent uh, Christian life, that they'd see something that's glorifying to you, and that they would have every opportunity in their own heart to see how it turned out and to make a right decision with all the evidence ahead of them that their own heart could choose to love you and serve you against the other choices. Lord, I ask you bless the singing now as we close. Lord, I thank you for a good weekend, very full, very busy weekend, but I thank you for it. I ask you to help us as we go our separate ways to uh, look for opportunity to speak for you, look for opportunity to be bold. Maybe somebody here does need to be a Phineas and kill something in their life. I ask you to help them to do that this week. Do it with zeal. Do it with an interest and love for the truth and righteousness and pleasing you. Maybe somebody needs to take some time and learn how to use that sword for some healing and for some cutting out and cleansing. Lord, I ask you please help us this week. We please you in Jesus' name I ask this. Amen. Amen. Abby, have you got a song? 367. 367. First, first and the second for the last. First and second only. Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with him within the narrow road? Would you have him bear your burden, carry all your load? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to. Cleanse your heart and make you free. His blood can fill your soul and you will see. T'was best for him to have his way with thee. Would you have him make you free and follow at his call? Would you know the peace that comes by giving all? Would you have him save you so that you can never fall? way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see. 
'Twas best for him to have his way with thee. Amen. Okay, in case you forgot, um, there's a refrigerator full of food. It's all barbecue food. It's all very good. There's there's um, barbecue sauce for the... Everybody said the brisket was a little dry. It's because we couldn't find the sauce. All it needed was sauce. It's amazing. Anyways, there's a uh, salad, if anybody needs to know about that. There's a... Uh, potato salad and what else lots of beans the beans are very good and other stuff drinks whatever that refrigerator is stuffed full we were, they, I heard them shoving it full I think they duct taped it shut back there so <laughs> please do stick around grab a plate if you don't have time fill up a plate and and staple it together and, and take off if you if you don't have if you're a bachelor you know who I'm talking to just go get some food don't be shy take some for tomorrow and I'm serious fill up a plate for for work or whatever Okay, thank you for being here today. Good singing, good service. Um, Brother Sawyer, would you just ask the Lord to bless the rest of the day?